Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us again. Uh, here we have been exploring this concept of what a job means to a community, what a job means to society. And so for those of you who are returning, welcome back and thanks so much. Last week, we talked about the close link between a healthy economy and a healthy environment. And I thought our speakers were fantastic and, and I personally learned a lot from it. This week, we're gonna talk about how a healthy economy also leads to vibrant and generous, and very meaningful giving, whether that's to charities and, ca and causes that help people and drive innovative solutions to some of society's challenges or to arts and culture that really enrich all of our lives. So thinking about that link between economic growth and philanthropy and the arts, you can go way back into U.S. history and see where it began. One of the earliest examples is actually with Thomas Jefferson. After the War of 1812, which, as you know, uh, resulted in the destruction of the original Library of Congress, he offered up his own collection of nearly 6,500 books to replace those that were lost when uh, the British invasor, invaders set fire to the original library. He saw philanthropy and the arts as important to our nationhood, and he was credited further by instilling them in our culture by Henry Latrobe. Henry Latrobe designed the White House colonnades and the south wing of the U.S. Capitol building. Jefferson was a patron of Latrobe's, personally commissioning him to build many of the projects that you now admire in DC's skyline. Today, philanthropic giving is part of our cultural and our national identity. And those who may not be able to give money certainly give time and effort and talent, which is, of course, equally important to the causes which they care about. In schools, young people are encouraged to participate in community service hours. AU's own Center for Community Engagement and Service is a great example of students giving back with time and energy and talent for community outreach. So you'll learn when you have your first jobs or those of you who are already in them are already learning that you'll most likely to be exposed to charitable programs that your employer is trying to participate in so that they find ways to help you give back to your community. There's a stat that's interesting. According to chief executives for corporate purpose, 82% of U.S. companies have a corporate foundation focused on these kinds of efforts. In fact, the business community leads in philanthropic giving, which gets to the focus of our discussion, the role of the private sector and the scope of its investment in philanthropy and the arts. In 2019, companies donated $24.8 billion for charitable purposes. 27% of that went to health and social service causes, while another four went to community and economic development. It won't surprise you to hear that the better the economy does, the more businesses and individuals are able to give and do give. Between 2017 and 2019, when the U.S. economy saw an increase in its real GDP, volunteer hours spent by employees participating in corporate community service opportunities increased by 26%. And half of the companies surveyed by chief executives for corporate purpose increased their median community investments from $26 million to $28 million during that period. While a growing economy certainly spurs giving and volunteering, we also know that businesses simply step up when their communities need them. Case in point, the pandemic. Despite severe financial challenges facing many, many businesses and industries, 45% of companies said they expected to step up their community investment budgets in response to the health crisis. It's it's super inspiring, and I hope it's not that surprising because it's simply what business does. What I hope is becoming clear through all of these sessions is that doing good isn't just a moral imperative, which it is, but it's also a business imperative. Businesses foster healthy, strong, vibrant communities because then they attract great workers and economic activity, which then, leads, which then lifts quality of life for all. Businesses invest in solutions to make our world a better place because we all live and work and operate in this world, and so we're our children and grandchildren. Businesses support alt, arts and culture because they're important industries that also create jobs for our nation's most creative talent and bring joy to our lives. I said at the beginning, it bears repeating, when businesses do well, they do good. Over the course of today's session, we're going to dive into those two ideas of giving both to um, philanthropy and charitable causes and also to the arts with two wonderfully distinguished guests. Our first speaker is an internationally recognized expert on economic development and philanthropy. Please join me in welcoming Una Osili. Nope, nope. 
Oh, Sully. No, see, I'm getting it wrong. I practiced beforehand, too. You'll correct me when you come on. She is the professor of economics and philanthropic studies and associate dean for research and international programs at Indiana University in the Lilly Family School of Philanthropy. We will have a Q&A after her remarks, so please uh, start putting your questions in now, and Una, the floor is yours. Osili, Dr. Osili. Thank you very much, Suzanne. <laughs> it is such a pleasure and an honor to join you today and to be with all of our uh, students who are gathered today. As all of you will note, we live in unprecedented times. The COVID-19 pandemic has shown us that we are a global community. And so with that, I'd like to share our latest research findings on the role that philanthropy is playing in these unprecedented times. So let me start by sharing my screen. Today's presentation will focus on the changing philanthropic landscape. The very first finding is that the donor landscape itself is changing. Let's take a look at the data. For the global economy as a whole, the Lilly Family School has been tracking cross-border giving. And we've seen in the COVID-19 pandemic, but even before this health and economic crisis, that countries of all different levels of development are engaged in philanthropy. Philanthropy is growing in both low-income, middle-income, and high-income countries as high net worth households and middle income households lean into some of the new tools and technologies available. We're also seeing more collaboration across government, business and the philanthropic sector. And one myth that we want to dispel whenever we share this data is that philanthropy is present in every culture, across geographies and across all religious traditions. When we look at the United States where we have very comprehensive data, we turn to a project that we've worked on now for more than two decades, Giving USA. According to the latest Giving USA numbers, US giving reached a new record of $450 billion going into the pandemic. Individuals still make up the majority of donations at 69%, but foundations also uh, have reached a new high at 17% of overall giving. Because of this group's particular interest in the corporate sector, I should note that corporations make up 5% of overall charitable giving. And that 5% has actually stayed relatively consistent over time. So while we've had growth in the role of individuals and foundations, uh, corporations have stayed relatively constant at 5% of overall giving. However, corporate giving is transforming during this period with corporations taking on much more of a role around volunteering, uh, cause marketing, and many other types of partnerships with nonprofits and causes. Now going to the second finding from our data, the question on everyone's mind is how will COVID-19 change philanthropy? The data thus far suggests that we may be at an inflection point in philanthropy. Over the past 12 months, we've seen philanthropy, both corp corporate donors, foundations, but also individuals at all income levels really step up in their generosity and even an expansion in overall generosity and the definitions that we're seeing. As far as large gift announcements during this time, according to data tracked by COVID, uh, the total amount contributed has uh, reached almost 17.9 billion dollars. A lot of those dollars are by corporate giving and corporate foundation programs. You can see 34 percent, but we also see a very strong role for community foundations and independent foundations. Finally, COVID-19 is not the only crisis our nation is dealing with. In addition to COVID-19, the health crisis, we've also had an economic crisis and a racial and social justice movement. Philanthropy has played a very visible role in responding to the issues that have been raised by the racial and social justice movement. Finally, looking ahead, 
technology appears to be uh, accelerating a lot of the trends that we're seeing. In fact, uh, one could say that the changes in the last 12 months have been another uh, force for change in the philanthropic sector. Going into the pandemic, online giving represented less than 10% of overall giving. We've seen growth in online giving, but also virtual engagement, virtual fundraising, virtual events, and many new approaches that have been pioneered during this pandemic. As we look ahead, the philanthropic sector has demonstrated a resilience, a strength, and a uh, capacity for innovation and collaboration during this period. There's also been a strong role for lifting up equity and inclusion concerns, and these are likely to continue even in, into 2021 and beyond. So I'll stop here and stop sharing my screen. We also have a short video, but I don't know if we have time for that or if we should go straight to the no, Q&A. No, go, please roll the video. Global challenges are growing in scope and complexity. From the refugee and migration crisis to more frequent natural disasters, and now the COVID-19 pandemic, each requires unprecedented and coordinated global action. The Global Philanthropy Tracker, or GPT, measures the world's response to challenges like these by quantifying the magnitude and sources of cross-border philanthropy to support charitable causes. With high quality data from 47 countries, the GPT is the first report of its kind to offer a holistic view of giving and volunteering across national borders. By tracking private philanthropy and other flows, the GPT highlights growth and expansion in donors, countries, and new tools engaged in cross-border giving. But it also highlights gaps in our knowledge and insights. Just one of five countries worldwide have aggregate data on giving across borders. Grassroots giving from low-income donors and emerging tools like impact investing are vital to communities, but difficult to track. And philanthropy leaders have incomplete access to information about where funding is deployed to help the most vulnerable and where gaps exist. Building on the GPT, we can create an even stronger framework to equip policymakers, business leaders, philanthropists, and NGO professionals to understand the scope of global giving and prioritize the most critical philanthropic work. Learn more at globalindices.iupui.edu. Thank you so much for that. Let me jump in here with a couple of questions, if I might. Um, you know, you just led with this global tracker. And my question to you is, how common is the way the United States thinks about philanthropy in terms of individual and corporate giving? How common is that globally? That's an excellent question and one that we get quite a bit. And one basic, I think, understanding is that philanthropy does vary across environments. But what is consistent is the commitment to generosity. So it, in some countries, we see corporations taking the lead. In the United States, it's actually individuals. Uh, as an example, in many parts of Asia, corporate giving actually is the, is the lion's share, and foundations and individuals are a smaller segment. Um, but uh, in some other parts of the world, we see foundations taking the lead and individuals playing a bigger role. A lot of that variation has to do with economics, policy, but also sociocultural traditions. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You mentioned in your remarks that the pandemic had given a boost to online giving. Um, I'd love to hear you talk more about how you've seen businesses and individuals kind of leverage those digital platforms. What are you seeing out there? It's fascinating. I'm so glad you asked about that. Um, as you note, before the pandemic, we saw online giving growing at double digit rates, but it was quite behind technological innovation in other areas, such as retail and consumer spending. In fact, many nonprofits were perhaps slower to adopt these digital tools. But with the pandemic, we've had more people working from home. We've had very few in-person events. And so a lot of charities of all different sizes and types have had to stand up 
uh, online giving tools. One example, the CDC Foundation actually uh, launched a new crowdfunding platform on a, a website called charity.com, and they raised over $50 million in just a few months. And so crowdfunding has really taken off in the pandemic, but then also virtual gaming, virtual events, virtual fundraisers. I'm sure many people on the audience today have attended those. And we've seen that in the arts, but we've also seen it across many different subsectors. What about virtual volunteering and the ways that people give their time? Yes, that is also very interesting. Uh, many companies have, uh, some of them had these virtual volunteering programs, but they were quite small. Uh, but with uh, social distancing and many individuals uh, working from home, but also trying to find ways to give back during a pandemic, we've had, um, let's say, a wealth of innovation. Some examples, tutoring online. So you've had many uh, employees yeah. that companies tutoring young kids. You've also had mentoring of entrepreneurs, which has been very interesting because especially with technology, you can mentor uh, young entrepreneurs in your own community, but also halfway across the globe, across uh, many geographies. So that has also been very interesting. And now that we have the technology and we're utilizing it, I think that some of these trends will continue. Well, that's, an, that's exactly where I was going to go. I'm, I'm interested in how you ended that about the trends continuing, because I, I think one question about this pandemic is what has permanently changed, right? And so what do you expect goes back the way that it was? And what do you imagine, the, where, where does it stick? The virtual fundraising, the virtual events, the virtual volunteering, what's permanently changed? Yes, so I would say that it's still too early to tell exactly how much of this will be permanent, but what is clear is that uh, the digital is here to stay. In other words, we will have a hybrid approach. Um, I think there is still a yearning for that human connection, and so there will be a return to some in-person fundraising, in-person events, in-person volunteering, but we're also learning that we have the capacity to foster um, social good from a distance and that you can impact individuals around the world. Uh, some of the examples that I have found really inspiring, uh, several companies have stood up these um, virtual volunteering programs, skill-based volunteering, and it's been, uh, I think, a great way for those employees to feel a sense of agency in this time where so much of, of the world is changing and you have the ability to improve someone else's life. So I think in, uh, building on this capacity will be important going forward, but we will have probably a mix of in-person as well as the virtual technology. Is there anything you could speak to about which business sectors or industries you think are leading the way right now in philanthropy? Well, we have had, um, as we have noted, a number of shocks to the business sector. So we've had the health shocks, the economic shocks, and the social and racial justice movement. It is really exciting to see companies really take the lead on um, lifting their voice so companies are not just using their time, their talent, but increasingly their platforms to address the social concerns of the time. And I will lift up some of the firms in the technology sector because they are essentially using all of their assets to help drive social change. Um, Netflix is one that has been quite vocal in its work, but I'll also say the financial sector has um, also taken a big step forward. Uh, we mentioned impact investing, the notion that you can not just use your philanthropic assets, but also your financial assets to help move the needle on social issues. So if we had to look back and see which companies have really stood out, uh, there are many. In fact, there are probably too many to count. And at the local level, we've also seen many small companies, not just large mm -hmm. companies. Mm -hmm. What's very interesting in addition to the commitments that have been made is this notion of companies using their voice and their platforms to raise awareness and to help drive um, community change. It's such an important point and something I think is part of the underpinning of this seminar, right? Which is that you can be on the outside of, of business and uh, wonder how business will use its 
power and wealth and to, to be impactful, or you can go on the inside and drive that impact and drive that voice, right? And so that's part of what I think we're talking about in this seminar. And, you know, it's interesting, yesterday in my day job at the chamber, we interviewed a bunch of people in Washington state about their vaccine rollout. And so it was the governor and the president of Microsoft and um, the head of US operations for Starbucks. And what was really interesting was how Starbucks has been working with Washington State to improve the patient experience of the vaccine. What does it feel like to wait in that room? How does it feel? How do you, in the 15 minutes before you're dismissed after your vaccine, how does it not feel too crowded? And so your point about uh, money, time, uh, talent, voice, but also expertise, right? They had an expertise in customer experience that they could bring forward to their community at a difficult time. Let, let me ask you a final question before we bring in our next speaker. Do you, again, one of the themes of this seminar has been that when companies do well, they can do good, that these aren't, they're not, and you're talking about how that, those, those uh, strategies are combined so often, right? But can you speak to what trends you see in philanthropy when the economy is healthy? Yes, so we have a, a wealth of research that shows that giving is very closely linked to social and economic conditions. And when times are good, we see that companies tend to give more. Um, and in general, it's also related to how companies, uh, essentially a, a company's own performance, not just the aggregate economy. Uh, as an example, during the Great Recession, we saw that a lot of companies um, did not necessarily cut back their giving because their own industries were doing quite well. So it can be very sector specific. I think it's important to note that. Um, in addition to the economic conditions, we are seeing uh, this, uh, I would say, combination of profits with purpose, where many companies are um, standing up their um, core values and standing uh, for their core values in difficult times. And I think that in this environment with social media, with so many, uh, I'd say, access to information, um, I think companies are going to be asked to do this even more. And it's not just about the dollars, as we've noted. It's uh, we talk about the four, sometimes even five Ts. So time, talent, treasure, and testimony. And it's increasingly important for companies to look at all of these assets that they have. And I know uh, you mentioned Starbucks, uh, some of the pharmaceutical companies have been quite exemplary in, in uh, providing skills to uh, their communities. But then um, in, early in the pandemic, we saw that expertise really being very important. Uh, one last point is that um, companies can also empower their employees to take that active role in the community. And we are seeing the rise of these dollars for doers programs. So it's about the company as a whole, but it's also about the company looking at its assets, its employees, its talent, and how it can support its employees to invest in the communities where they live and work and to have that sort of lasting impact. Uh, Dr. Osley, that was so inspiring. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us today. We really appreciate you being with us. It was my pleasure. Thank you for having me and very excited to participate. Look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you so much. We'll turn now to our next speaker and I'm delighted to welcome uh, the president of the American Express Foundation. This is Tim McClyman and he's gonna talk to us about the importance of investment in the arts. And so let me give you the floor. Great, thank you very much, Susan. Uh, it's a pleasure to, to be here. Uh, you know, I think that the first uh, question I wanted to address is just, you know, why, why invest in the arts? Uh, you know, you mentioned Thomas Jefferson. Uh, I think that any great uh, nation in the world uh, throughout history has wanted to foster creativity, foster innovation uh, and inventions, and the United States is no exception. Uh, to that. Uh, our, the framers of our uh, Constitution uh, provided uh, the authority to Congress to promote uh, the arts and to promote innovation and invention. So I think that fostering creativity, fostering uh, innovation is just something that, that most countries and uh, cities are interested in, in doing. Uh, the second thing is really improving the quality of life in communities. Uh, this is something uh, that's been mentioned as well, that people like to live in communities where there are vibrant 
um, arts uh, organizations where there are restaurants uh, and parks and places to go. Uh, and so quality of life issues are incredibly important uh, to communities. And then finally, uh, it, it's about attracting and retaining a workforce in communities. So creating jobs, uh, but creating a, a life for people, uh, that's not only how you attract people to uh, communities, but it's how you retain them uh, in their communities as well. So from my point of view, those three uh, reasons are the primary reasons that uh, communities and because of that corporations support the arts. It's not a real Zoom meeting if we don't have one, I was on mute too long moment. So <laughs> sorry about that. Um, talk to us about like, why would a company like American Express decide to get involved in arts investing? Well, besides those three th reasons that I just mentioned, yeah. um, <laughs> you know, which are our primary um, reasons, uh, you know, the arts create jobs. Uh, they create jobs, uh, not only directly, but indirectly. So it's the jobs that, that arts organizations uh, hire people, they hire artists. I mean, I'm chairman of the board of an organization called Second Stage Theater in New York, and we employ 300 people a year in producing theater uh, in New York City. So, so you've got those direct jobs and then you've got indirect jobs too, all the restaurant workers and bars and uh, small businesses that depend on arts organizations, printers, uh, costume shops, uh, um, you know, other kinds of, of security, uh, construction uh, workers, uh, maintenance, you know, workers uh, in, in cities. So you've got the direct jobs, you've got the indirect jobs, and this leads to an economic vitality uh, in communities that is incredibly uh, important. And then, you know, companies are concerned about quality of life issues, that mm -hmm. this is how we attract and retain uh, employees, you know, American Express is headquartered in New York City. Uh, we've got a lot of creative people uh, who work at American Express. We have artists uh, who work for American Express so that they can support their art. Uh, you know, and we, but we employ uh, a lot of creative people in marketing uh, jobs and creating content uh, for websites and for social media. Uh, and so we employ a lot of creative people. We want to be able to attract and retain those kinds of, of, of people, you know, in places that we uh, have a presence um, all over the world. Um, and then this, you know, this, this, it, we pay taxes, you know, as a, as a company and uh, our employees pay taxes, right? So there's an economic impact that comes from the fact that as taxpayers uh, in communities, we want to support you know, activities uh, in communities that really lead to that quality of life that we're all seeking. So let me separate this out a little bit into pre and post pandemic. So let's talk about the pre pandemic, well, even post pandemic, you know, before, the normal world. How do you, when companies are engaging well in arts philanthropy, what does it look like? Well, I think there's a whole variety of ways that companies support the arts. Uh, Una mentioned uh, some of them when she was talking about contributions. Um, obviously, and you, you mentioned the fact that many companies have foundations, we make grants to nonprofit organizations, but there's also a huge amount of sponsorship activity uh, that happens with both for-profit and not-for-profit arts and entertainment um, organizations. Uh, there are marketing uh, programs, marketing campaigns that we might feature artists uh, and arts organizations in those campaigns, or they might help us create those campaigns. There are, um, of course, we employ uh, people. We, we loan our facilities uh, to artists and arts organizations. Uh, as you were talking about before, we have employees who volunteer mm -hmm. um, in communities, both on-site volunteering, but also virtual volunteering, which we've seen a huge increase or uptick in virtual volunteering. And of course, our employees buy tickets to events, right? They attend events, they buy tickets. Uh, companies like American Express buy tickets to events. We support dinners and benefits, you know, uh, to celebrate uh, people in our communities. So there's a whole host of ways that companies can be supportive of arts organizations beyond uh, just making a grant. I love that. Okay, so now take us through, we're in the pandemic and you can't do some of the things that you've just described, right? So. How have you, I mean, you're, you're 
you're on the board of the Americans for the Arts, right? How do you advocate for continued philanthropy for the arts in this crazy time? Yeah, well, that's a good question. I mean, you know, Americans for the Arts is the, the primary advocacy organization for the arts in the United States, uh, headquartered there in Washington. And, you know, they were very instrumental in ensuring that arts organizations were part of the stimulus packages that have been passed by Congress, that they were eligible for PPP loans uh, that were incredibly important uh, to them and for small businesses. Uh, there was just, you know, uh, Senator Schumer just uh, got legislation passed uh, that's called the Shuttered Venues legislation, where there's $15 billion uh, available for organizations that have no earned income um, any longer. And as you know, being there at the chamber and in, in Washington, these things just don't happen by themselves. Uh, they happen because there are advocates um, and uh, Americans for the Arts and a whole host of other organizations, but also corporations, you know, have stepped up to advocate for this kind of legislation, to advocate for stimulus uh, packages that are important uh, to communities, not just for for-profit for uh, businesses and small businesses, but for not-for-profit um, organizations as well. So I, I think that whether you're, you know, the Smithsonian Institution uh, in Washington, or you're a small business uh, in Iowa City, or you're an arts organization in Los Angeles, uh, this kind of stimulus from uh, that the federal government is incredibly uh, important, and this is how we're going to see organizations survive uh, through COVID. So hopefully, we can get back to having performances and productions and greeting people uh, in a face-to-face -face way uh, going forward. I think I've also been trying to give people a commercial and you can tell me if it's the wrong commercial. I'll, you, I'll write and you can edit, okay? But I, I've been giving people a commercial that when your favorite venue right now is, is producing an online version or a parking lot version or whatever it is, rather than think to yourself, wow, that doesn't sound as good or I wouldn't be as interested, you know, maybe we just all need to suck it up a little bit and support them by buying tickets, even if it isn't exactly the experience we want because it will help them survive. Is that true? Do individual ticket sales yeah, still that, matter? That's absolutely true. You know, that the, the usual arts organization uh, gets about 50% of its revenue from earned income or ticket sales. Mm -hmm. uh, and if so, if you take that 50% away, which is what's happened during COVID, uh, then yes, you still have 50% in contributions and other kinds of, of revenue, but it's, it's devastating for arts organizations who have had to furlough their staff, lay off staff, cut their expenses. Um, and so when they are able to produce events uh, online, uh, yes, I think spending $10, $15, $25 uh, to support your local arts organizations uh, during the pandemic is very similar to supporting your local restaurants uh, for takeout, right? So, you know, American Express has just recently created Takeout Tuesdays um, and Takeout Tuesday is just a way to encourage people to just order takeout uh, or delivery on Tuesday um, evenings to help your local restaurant. It's the same uh, issue with local arts organizations as well. Hel help them in any way that you can. So all the DC people should hang up and go to the 930 Club website and at least buy a t-shirt, right? This is a good time to stock up on our arts merchandise too, right? That's exactly right. So, so one of the things I've been noticing in the arts is that... Um, I think what's so important about the arts and the way that they enrich our lives is in part that it, it expands your creative mind even to bring back to work or to your family, right? Just any time you spent immersed in the arts gives you that gift of enriching and making you more creative and expanding your mind a little bit. So one of the things that I've been watching that I think is so cool are how innovative, not surprisingly, um, artists have been in trying to figure out new venues for their art or things to showcase in this time. Do any stand out to you as being kind of innovative or, or that maybe might even stick around post pandemic? Well, I, I mean, there are just so many different cases. It's hard to, to mention just one or two, but I, you know, artists are innovators, right? So they, they are creative, uh, they're survivors. Uh, so they're not going to let something like a pandemic, you know, get in the way of their art uh, and, and they will create um, opportunities to share their art um, with people because, you know, it's one thing to, you know, write a book or write a play or create a film or, or compose a piece of music. But if you can't share that 
with an audience, if you can't share it with other people, it, it's not nearly as satisfying uh, to you as an artist. So people will find ways to distribute their work. I think that, that listen, obviously the internet uh, is a huge distribution system for the arts uh, right now. And, and as you mentioned, it may not yield as much earned income um, for artists or for our arts organizations, but it is a way uh, to survive. Uh, the pandemic and, and I think everyone's just hopeful that you know we'll get back to being able to to witness some of these uh, kinds of things face to face but as as Una said the the virtual you know distribution will survive as well I mean we will have both um, going forward because uh, there are some advantages uh, certainly there are cost advantages uh, to distributing things virtually much less costly um, and, and so, and, and people will still be on Zoom. Uh, Zoom's not gonna go away. Uh, you know, the internet is not gonna go away. So we will see, I think, uh, both kinds of, of events and, and all different kinds of arts um, going forward. But it's, in many ways, it's a, a, an exciting time uh, for that. It's a challenging time, but it's an exciting time when, when artists and organizations are innovating. And I think the companies uh, because they want to foster uh, creativity, innovation can be, you know, really instrumental in helping uh, organizations and artists do that during this time. You know, it's interesting. We were talking as a team the other day at, about uh, a speaker we heard at a chamber event who was talking about the fact that there's this big movement now in STEM and this big movement to educate our children and teach them to code. And this speaker was saying, but that's exactly what artificial intelligence can do right? That AI can code. And so is it really the arts and creativity and culture and humanness uh, that's really where we want to be taking our kids? Should we be going back to a liberal arts education? Because that's what AI can't do. And I'm curious, given both your arts and business experience, what you think about that? Well, first of all, I'm a liberal arts graduate. Uh, so I, my uh, undergraduate degree is in English. Uh, you know, English literature, uh, that it didn't prevent me from going on getting a law degree and, and ultimately working in, in business. Uh, you know, I think that corporations are looking for, you know, generalists. Um, yes, they, they need engineers and they need lawyers and they need accountants and they need programmers. All of that is true, uh, but they're also looking for well-rounded um, individuals. And so I, I do think that the arts can help contribute to that kind of uh, environment and you know creativity is important whether that creativity is inventing something or creating something or even just writing something you know a, a memo that is more interesting than your normal memo um, inside a company I mean we employ people who do nothing but employee communications work at American Express that they are posting things on our internet site and they're writing memos you know, to, to colleagues, either on behalf of the CEO or other leaders, and you want them to be interesting and fun and well-written. Um, and so that that's where creativity comes in uh, to play, but it's also where a liberal arts education can be uh, really helpful. So, you know, you need both uh, in companies. Uh, I think there's plenty of room for liberal arts graduates. Uh, I'm an example of that uh, working in companies. And, and so I think you have to go where your heart is, where your passion um, is, you know, as an individual. Uh, but, you know, we can't all be programmers uh, and we can't all be scientists. Uh, we can't all be, you know, business people. Uh, you know, there are uh, lots of different opportunities for folks. And I also think to your point, I'm also a liberal arts graduate, undergraduate, and then I went on and got my MBA. Um, but I do think there are a lot of business jobs, whether it's leading or managing or sales, where being a well-rounded, interesting person is part of it. An ability to develop real relationships based on authentic interests is a part of it. You know? so Absolutely. That, that's a great point. We have a question from uh, one of the audience members here. I'm going to read it to you. Being a global company, how do you allocate your resources based on the various characteristics and needs of the different locations where you operate? Yeah, excellent question. I could spend the next hour um, on that question alone, probably. Uh, you know, every every company is going to approach this to work differently, uh, and uh, you know, it, every company has a different set of priorities uh, and processes. But from from an American Express standpoint, 
We like to uh, follow our business uh, into communities uh, and we like to support the communities where, our, we, where we have employees, uh, where we have a major presence. And so in the United States, for instance, while there are lots of you know, wonderful communities around the country, we have four primary work locations uh, in the US. They're New York, uh, Phoenix, Arizona, Salt Lake City, uh, Utah, and Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Uh, we add to the, and so most of our philanthropy goes to those four places. We add to that Washington DC uh, because it's the, the seat of government um, and, and certainly as a highly regulated uh, industry, which we are, uh, it's important for us to have a presence in Washington, but we follow that same kind of example in other countries as well. So we look, where do we have a major presence um, in a country where we have major employees and we have 65,000 employees around the world. So we've got a lot of different uh, locations, but let's, you know, let's be there to support our employees uh, because not only do we want to support local uh, organizations with grants, but we want to support them with volunteer um, opportunities as well. So we, we deploy those uh, 65,000 people. We mobilize them uh, into volunteer activities all over the world. And of course, pre-COVID, they were all or mostly you know, on-site programs like working in you know, health organizations or soup kitchens or cleaning up parks or, or uh, volunteering for an arts organization. But we also do a lot of consulting work with nonprofit organizations. Uh, some of that's on site, some of it's virtual. Uh, and it's an opportunity for our employees to use their marketing skills and their finance skills and strategic planning skills to support um, organizations um, all, all over the world. So we try to follow uh, our business, follow our employees. Um, in the communities rather than leading, you know, we don't go into a community and, and engage in philanthropy if we don't really have a presence um, there. But uh, being a global company, we have a presence in lots of places. And so there's no shortage of, of opportunity there. I'm so happy that you brought up that idea of bringing individual expertise into uh, a charity. You know, we talked with Una about companies bringing their expertise to bear on big challenges. Um, but I think you're so right. I see it so often in DC where uh, the people who choose to make philanthropic work their life's mission are so good hearted and know so much about the problem they're trying to solve. That doesn't mean that they're great accountants, right? That doesn't mean that they're great uh, with data analytics. And so the ability for uh, business people to go in and volunteer their time. It doesn't mean that they necessarily have to be stocking shelves or serving in a soup kitchen um, or ushering. It could be that they're bringing behind the scenes uh, business acumen, which which these organizations can really need. I'm really happy that you brought that up. Yeah, I mean, not only do they desperately need it, but in many cases they can't afford it uh, if they're smaller uh, organizations. And so the fact that we can provide consulting services, uh, I mean, we created a consulting business essentially uh, where we have eight practice areas and we recruit uh, proposals from nonprofits in those eight practice areas. And then we recruit teams of employees to focus on those projects uh, for those organizations. And, and we recruit people, they have to sign up for a job on a particular team for a particular project and show that they have the skills to do that work for the nonprofit. Because the, the worst thing we could do is not to provide the best kind of service for nonprofits. We want you know, our service to be the best, to be pride ourselves in that. Um, and so we want to ensure that, uh, you know, not everyone uh, is doing everything. We're, we're good at some things, we're not so good at other things. For instance, we, we, you know, we're not good at fundraising as a company. We don't have people that are experts in, in fundraising. So it wouldn't make sense for us to, to consult with an organization on fundraising, but we're really good at marketing. Um, and so, you know, marketing, digital marketing, uh, competitive analysis, that kind of work is something that we can do and that organizations really need uh, that kind of uh, assistance and most of them find it transformational. It's interesting too, you talked a minute ago, the other, the other thing I wanted to pick up on was you talking about quality of life and how important that is for you, for your employees in the cities where they're operating. Um, but we had a 
panel a couple of weeks ago where we had an entire panel from Tulsa. And it was the chamber exec in Tulsa and two companies in Tulsa. And one of the things that they were talking about was how the cost of living in Tulsa, I'm making these numbers up, but they're directionally right. It's like 12% below the national average. And yet the wages were 12% above the national average. And what they were doing to draw a qualified workforce there was working, but then that was having a big impact on architecture and the art scene and the music scene, because once those people got there, the vibrant art community kind of came with them. And so I guess it's an ecosystem, isn't it? You, you, the arts and business and quality of life and workers and education, you know, it's hard to pull one piece out, isn't it? That, that's absolutely you know correct. And, and listen, hey, there are places where, you know, there are different kinds of, of assets um, in, in communities. I mean, you know, my sister lives in Denver and it's the mountains there and skiing and the people go there, you know, to, to, so that they can be outdoors, you know, for instance. But in other places, it's, you know, it's a vibrant cultural scene and it's restaurants and, and other kinds of businesses that, that spring up around cultural facilities. And it's, you know, it's a vibrant artist um, community where there are galleries and people creating um, work. So every, every you know, a community is going to be a little different. Washington, of course, being the seat of government, people come to work for the government there, and that's a, a major attraction. But speaking of attractions, there's also tourism, um, and, and we haven't really mentioned tourism yeah. um, here. But you know, many many cities, including places like New York City or Washington D.C., depend on tourists. And tourists have been taken out of the equation during the pandemic. Uh, and that also has had a huge impact on businesses and nonprofit um, organizations. And so, you know, if you're, if you're going to have a vibrant tourist um, industry and attract tourists, they, you have to attract them to do something. I mean, people, people don't come to, you know, New York City to tour warehouses, right? They come for culture, they come for, for Broadway and cultural organizations and, and museums. Um, and so every you know, community is gonna be different there in that regard, but uh, tourism is just another way that companies can help have impact um, in, in communities by helping to attract uh, tourists and to, to, to continue to attract tourists. I think it's so important and it, it reminds me that tourism is a piece and it's also um, commuters, right? If you go into downtown DC right now, there are a lot of people who live in DC, of course, but there are a lot of people like me who live in Virginia who were commuting in. And so the ecosystem of parking garages and banks and, but also just diners and sandwich shops and food trucks, but also the arts because you stay in the city to do things after work or you read about things or see billboards about things in the city that you wanna come back in and do over the weekend. So I think it's tourists and also commuters and again, we just get back to this concept of it all being an ecosystem, you know. Right. Let me let me ask you one last question before I let you get back to your multiple jobs. One, one is um, that I want to ask you to lift up for a second and look at the whole foundation and and kind of corporate um, responsibility. And kind of what trends do you see coming as we lift out of the pandemic and look into 2021? How do you think people such as yourselves that are running big corporate foundations are thinking about next year? Sure. Well, you know, during the pandemic, we really uh, were focused on relief efforts. You know, it was a crisis. Uh, it was like a natural disaster. Mm -hmm. um, and so we approached our work much like we would a natural disaster, that there was a need for, you know, things like shelter and food and, you know, medical equipment, you know, for, for healthcare workers. And so we, you know, gave a lot of grants uh, to support healthcare workers. Uh, a lot of food distribution programs, Feeding America, food banks, um, but also created initiatives with our partners. And this is another way that companies can, can help is that we have partners. We have uh, lots of partners. Like, so we created an initiative with Hilton, uh, for instance, uh, to give free hotel rooms to healthcare workers so that they didn't have to go home uh, between shifts and then potentially infect their families. But of course, once you gave them a room, they also needed food. Um, and so we designed a partnership with the World Central Kitchen to provide meals uh, to healthcare workers who were staying in these free rooms that we help support with, with Elton. Um, so, but it was really, really focused on, you know, immediate 
needs. Now, as we you know start to, to emerge from the pandemic, it's all about recovery, right? It's so uh, how do you bring people back to work? How do you bring people back to uh, communities? How do we help uh, organizations uh, rehire all those people that they furloughed um, or laid off? Uh, how do we get uh, audiences back to arts organizations? That's a huge marketing challenge, right? Because not only do you have to present the performances and productions, but you got to convince people to come back and that it's safe to come back and fun to come back uh, to the theater. So that's a marketing challenge, which is all about recovery. And then the third phase is about rebuilding, right? So once you get through the recovery stage, it has to be sustainable uh, for the future. And so you have to build in uh, processes and build in capital uh, in order for these organizations to sustain themselves going forward. So this, this, you know, trifecta of relief, recovery, rebuilding uh, is really the way that most uh, corporations have viewed uh, their aid uh, during COVID certainly is true for uh, American Express. And, you know, we, we see that there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, we're optimistic about the future and, and we are, you know, laser focused on helping nonprofits and small businesses recover from the pandemic and, and really rebuild uh, in their community. I'm glad you brought up the small business angle. I know how committed you are to that. We are too at the chamber. We do a lot of work together, of course, in that area. Um, I think you make such a good point. It brings me back to customer experience. You know, how is the customer experience of the arts going to change? Because we think immediately of crowds or lines or egress. And so that customer experience piece and helping arts organizations think about how to do that in a way that brings people back comfortably will be such important, important work. So we'll look forward to figuring out how the chamber can be helpful to you. I know we have state and local chambers across the country that are so eager to help their small businesses and their communities rebound and the arts will be a big part in that. So thank you, Tim, for joining us today. Well, thank you. And we really appreciate our partnership uh, with the chamber, uh, particularly on our program to, to back black owned uh, small businesses, yes. uh, which is a terrific effort so so thank you for having me here today i appreciate it very much talk to you soon and to the audience thank you so much for joining us today we're very appreciative that you would spend your time with us um, this concept of how business helps both philanthropy and the arts i think is another important piece of this seminar and putting together what a job means to a community and to a society we will be meeting next time about what policies we need to promote these issues as we go forward. In other words, when we get together again on March 18th, we will say, okay, if it's true that a job means security and dignity to a family, that it means cleaner air, cleaner water, cleaner environment to a community, that it means better health outcomes for families and individuals, that it means more contributions to the arts and philanthropy, then what do we have to do as a society to create the right kind of jobs in the places that need them most. I think this topic will be even more important as we think about coming through the pandemic in the hundreds of thousands of small businesses, all job creators that have been lost and what we can do together as a community to help that group. So thank you again for being with us and we'll see you on the 18th.